Hello fellow Keyforgers, I'm Carlo from All You Can Board and today I'm going to be doing this video on when to mulligan in Keyforge. So I'm going to say right now this is one of the most important decisions in the entire game of Keyforge. This can often you know, set you up for success or failure right from the start and this can often be the biggest determining factor in whether you're going to win or lose the game or at least have a good game with your deck. Um, the thing I want to highlight right off the bat is that there isn't one sort of specific mulligan strategy. You have to assess a bunch of different factors um, and that's kind of what a, the focus of this video is going to be. Um, so the, I'm going to divide this into a few parts. The first part is going to be more of an intro for players who either maybe don't know as much about Keyforge, might be newer to the game. So first off, what is a mulligan and how does it work in Keyforge? So um, if you're familiar with other games like Magic the Gathering, the mulligan in Keyforge is not as much of a risk because you're, let's say you start, whether you're first, you know, if you're first player, you have seven cards, second player, you have six cards. But either way, if you mulligan, you get rid of your whole hand, um, you shuffle it back into your deck, and then you draw the same amount of cards minus one. But in Keyforge, at the end of your turn, you always draw back up to six cards. So unlike in Magic, where you basically lose that card and, you know, card drawing is a lot harder to come by, in Keyforge, you're always going to draw back up to six cards anyway. So to take a mulligan is pretty low risk um, because, you you know, you might get some of the same cards back. You might get different cards back. But either way, it's the mulligan is you get rid of your whole hand. You can't pick which cards to keep and which ones to get rid of. I also want to highlight before we go any further that there is an excellent post um, by a user on Reddit named Blinking Line. I'm going to link it in the description below. Thank you so much to Blinking Line for putting together uh, this thread previously called First Hand Draw Possibilities, uh, or Probabilities, pardon me. And this has also been uh, added to the Archon Arcana database for new players. And there's stuff about the um, kind of probability of also if you of getting certain specific cards out of your deck. So this video isn't really going to dive in as much to the statistics sort of odds and probability um, because other people like Blinking Line have done a much better job than I could ever hope to do on that. Um, I just want to really highlight how big of a resource that is and how you definitely want to use that as one of your kind of guiding factors uh, when you're considering whether or not to mulligan. Um, so I also want to mention that um, basically one thing to keep in mind is that the more cards you play in your first turn, I mean, when you, if you were the first player, you're only going to play one card, but if you go second, just in general in Keyforge, the more cards that you play on one turn or discard and get rid of, like, let's say you get rid of, you know, six of your cards in your hand are of one house. Let's say you play, f or, or out of your six cards, five of our are of one house. If you get rid of five cards right away, then, you know, your deck is 36 cards and there's 12 each of three different houses. If you got rid of five of those 12 already, now out of those remaining, um, you know, 30 cards that are left in your, in your deck to draw from, you already know that there's only seven from that one house, leaving 23 cards distributed equally between the other two houses. So just touching on that probability thing from uh, Blinking Lines, awesome resource, you know, unless your deck has some other specific reason not to, a safe bet is often to mull, like to keep your hand if you have like four or five or six cards of the same house because you're just going to go through, like you're going to get probably a higher chance of getting board presence out early uh, and then also having it swing back into the favor of getting more cards of the houses you haven't played yet. So you're just going to get through your deck quicker, which is a lot of the time a really good thing in Keyforge. So now we're going to talk about some initial considerations. So these are the most important things I think to think about and take into account uh, when you're deciding whether or not to mulligan. So the first thing is what type of format are you playing? If this is a sealed deck format, like you're playing in a tournament, you're just opening up a deck for the first time and learning it, and you're not going to know other people's decks going into the matchup, then you have to basically just play off of your own deck and what you know. So you might just recognize some cards. This might be a new, you know, a new set. You don't know many of the cards. So that's where you want to lean more on um, blinking lines kind of like probability thing a little more and it's generally just going to be better to get more cards like leaning in, into one house you can play as much as possible early on um, generally speaking so it's like the, the better you know the less you know about your opponent or your own deck the more you want to kind of lean on the probability side of things if it's not a sealed deck tournament then how well do you know your deck how well do you know your opponent's deck have you played against this deck before have you played against this um you know, decks from the set before? Do you recognize the cards in the card list when you look at your opponent's deck? How many times have you played your own deck? You got to really take this into account because there's so many different factors you can consider. If your opponent's deck is really heavy on creatures and you only have one or two cards that really have board clear in your deck or help you deal with that, you might want to mulligan or if you have those early because you might want to save those for later in the game. You, you might not want those in your opening hand. If you have one board clear and your opponent's deck has like 25 creatures and they're playing like Saurian and have these big body creatures or Sanctum or Brobnar, you know, and you get gateway to dis in your opening hand, well, you need that later. So you might want to mulligan, right? Um, 
Same thing with like if your opponent has like eight artifacts and they're really good, you might want to, you know, depending when, what time, type of stage in the game those artifacts are useful in, you might want to consider that depending on your keeping or mulliganing for your uh, artifact destruction type cards. Do you have a fast or a slow deck? Per, like, if your deck you know is a fast deck, then you might want to just always, you know, if you have a, like, lots of amber generation, you're just trying to race through your deck as quickly as possible, then you're pretty much always going to play that probability game of trying to mulligan to get as many cards of one house as you can. Whereas if you have a slower deck, it's more of a control deck, um, then you might want to wait and kind of like see what cards you're getting to see how it's actually going to play out and what kind of board presence you're going to get early. So I'm going to give some examples of those deck archetypes a little later just to help you kind of guide your mulligan decisions. Um, but yeah, you basically want to consider those late game cards and reactive cards like board clears and key cheats, artifact destruction, all that kind of stuff is better late game. So if you start with it in your opening hand, but you know they're going to be useful cards later, then you might want to mulligan to hope to get them later in the game instead. Um, the other thing is, is it a mismatch? So if you... Basically, the more of a mismatch you feel you have, if you feel like your deck is not as good, you've been losing games with it, you know it has a, like a low SAS score, or it's not very successful, you have to be more aggressive with your mulligan because getting an important start is going to be more important than ever. If you have a really, really good deck and you feel like, well, a lot of the cards are good, like if I had this or this, whatever, it's kind of the same, then you maybe don't have to be as aggressive. You can be happy with what you have. But if you, like when I play with an inferior deck against my opponent, I'm extra aggressive with the mulligan. I mulligan almost every time unless I'm like thrilled with my starting hand. So you have to adjust your, how aggressive you are with your mulligan, yeah, based on the mismatch and how much you think your opponent's deck is going to outperform yours because then an important start, uh, a big, you know, a strong start is even more important for you. Okay, another thing you want to consider is whether you're first or second player because it works a lot differently in this game. If you're first player, you start with seven cards and on the very first turn of the game, you can only play or discard a single card regardless of which house you pick. Whereas when you're second player, you start with six cards and it's just the regular rules, you can play as many as you want. So, the mulligan is extra important when you're the first player and there's even more incentive to like it's basically it's safer and there's more incentive to mulligan as first player because again even if you mulligan and you draw six cards and then you play one down to five you're still going to draw a card to go back up to six but the other thing you have to consider about first player is because you're only going to play one of those cards even if you mulligan and then you play one, you're only going to draw one new card. So basically when you're first player, you're almost stuck with what you have, right? So you have to think not only what is my first turn doing for me with that single card I'm playing, but what is my hand setting me up for on my second turn as well? So the best things you can aim for on your first turn are usually creatures with a passive ability. Um, the first example that comes to mind is like Mother, which allows you to just draw another card at the end of your turn, um, you know, or something like... Um, What's the one that prevents your opponent from drawing up to cards on their turn? Like something that sits there that right away makes your opponent think, oh, I got to get rid of that creature immediately. If you have one of those in your hand, that's always a good play on the first turn. Same with artifacts. Artifacts can be so, you like most artifacts in this game are very useful. Some decks you only have two or three artifacts. Others you have an artifact heavy deck, but getting an artifact out early or a creature with a good passive ability, I think are your two strongest bets. Um, but again, if all you're doing is getting an artifact that like stops your opponent from forging a key, you know, Early in the game, that might not come into play, and if the other cards in your hand don't do much early, maybe it's not worth it. Maybe you should mulligan. So that's something to consider. So you have to be mo more aggressive with your mulligan and take more risks with it when you're first player because that extra, you know, you can really fall behind quickly. If you only play one card and then your opponent goes second and they put down four creatures in the first turn or three creatures in artifact or something like that, you're going to feel right away like you're really behind. You're, you're on the back foot right from the start. So that, that start is so important as the first player. Um, but if you're second, a lot of the time you just want to look for getting that big momentum. You know that your opponent just played one card. If you can get, like, if you, as the second player on your starting hand, you have, like, three or four creatures in one house, that's almost always going to be the best play because even if the abilities aren't great, if you put down, let's say, even three creatures and then your opponent goes and they can't get rid of them, on your next turn you can already take that house and reap with all three of those creatures. That's three amber, you're halfway to a key already. So getting multiple creatures out on the first turn as the second player is so valuable and will almost always supersede any other, you know, um, chase car or cards that you really want uh, that can provide value to you in the game.
All right, so now I'm gonna go into a couple of deck examples here, just the decks that I have. Most of these, I think th I'm gonna go do four of them. Three of these four are decks from Call of the Archons, and the reason why is just because these are the decks I've had the most experience with that I've played the most among, or among the most in my collection. So these are the ones that I have a lot of experience and can speak on how successful the mulligan has been. Um, and I just know these decks really well. So, and I'm gonna link these in the description below. So if you wanna click on them and check out the deck list while I'm going through them, I will also put the deck list card up on screen. Uh, so the first one is Sigbu of the Smoky and Lanky. So this is the first deck I ever opened. It's Mars, Shadows, and Untamed, and this is a combo deck. So the strength of this deck, the Shadows is basically kind of like the support. The Shadows is like, there's some good cards, whatever, but I'm not going to win the game based on the Shadows. There's a couple of big, big combos. There's a lot of big synergy in this deck, and I've played this deck against people before where they say, like, that almost felt unfair. What was I supposed to do against that combo? So um, start with Untamed. So Untamed, and this is more of the secondary. Mars is the bigger house in this, I would say, but Untamed has two Witch of the Eye. So with this card you can reap to get a card back from your discard pile that you've already used. So if I get two, whether it's one or two of these Witch of the Eye out in play, and then I can take back either Cooperative Hunting or Nocturnal Maneuver. So Cooperative Hunting uh, is the one that does a bunch of damage uh, spread out. Uh, deal one damage for each friendly creature in play. You can divide this damage among any number of creatures. So anytime I have two Witch of the Eye in play and I have Cooperative Hunting in my hand, I play Cooperative Hunting, do a bunch of damage, use Witch of the Eye, get Cooperative Hunting back, play it again, use Witch of the Eye, the second Witch of the Eye, get Cooperative Hunting back, do it again. Like I've just wiped my opponent's board out and the more creatures you get rid of, the higher chance or the less of a chance they have of, you know, they don't have as many creatures to fight your Witches of the Eye. So if they don't have like cards that just get rid of creatures, they're going to really struggle. Uh, and the other one is, uh, as I said, Nocturnal Maneuver is the one that exhausts creatures, uh, exhaust up to three creatures and it gains you an Amber. So imagine, you, you know, you play Nocturnal Maneuver, it gains you an Amber, you reap with Witch of the Eye, that gains you an Amber to also get Nocturnal Maneuver back. Sometimes you can exhaust your opponent's whole board. So I've had games where um, having two, once you have two of these Witch of the Eye out and you have, you're taking these cards back, it's just so hard for your opponent to stop you, okay? So that's something where I might mulligan based on, like, chasing for that combo to try and get one or two, like, even if I have that dreaded 2-2-2 two, two, two house distribution where you play two cards and then you're still stuck with two each, you never feel like you're gonna have a big turn. If I start the game with double Witch of the Eye and those are my only two untamed cards, there's no way I'm gonna mulligan. I'm gonna play both of those Witch of the Eye first turn because having them in play right off the bat sets me up for these potential success with these combos. On the Mars side of things, you have Battle Fleet, which lets you draw a bunch of cards based on how many Mars cards you have in your hand. Then the Soft Landing with the double Squawker. Soft Landing lets you put a creature into play ready, and then uh, Squawker lets you either stun an enemy creature, um, or it lets you ready one of your, sorry, ready a Mars creature or stun a non-Mars creature. So you can use this in a bunch of different ways, but the ideal combo, I'm sorry, before that, I'm gonna get into a couple more of these. John Smith, which is one of the best cards, one of my favorite cards in the game, one of my, the best Mars cards. Um, fight or reap to ready a non-agent Mars creature. John Smith is the only agent in the game, so it's basically ready a Mars creature. And then Ookslix the Zookeeper, which is, again, one of my absolute favorite cards. Uh, two power elusive reap, put an enemy creature into your archives, and if that creature leaves your archives, into its owner's hand instead. So I've had games where I use Battle Fleet, I already have some Mars cards in my hand, draw a bunch more cards, suddenly maybe you have six, seven Mars cards in your hand. You soft landing your John Smith into play, then you put in your Ooks Licks, then you can, you know, your soft, your John Smith is already readied, so, you're, you know, and then you can use John Smith to reap, to gain an Amber, to then ready Ooks Licks, to then reap with him, to gain another Amber, archive opponent's a creature, and then use Squawker to ready John Smith, so you can reap with him again, to ready Ooks Licks, to reap with him again, like, it just triggers this crazy synergy, this chain reaction, and the, not only are you taking your ar opponent's creatures off the board and archiving them, but you're also gaining a bunch of amber. It's an amber spike, so um, I'm not going to go too much more into this deck, but it just shows you, like, basically, if I get a bunch of Mars cards in my hand, especially with Battle Fleet early on, um, there's a good chance I'm going to keep my hand, and if I get those Witches of the Eye for Untamed, then I'm going to use that Untamed combo as much as I can. But other than those two combos, this deck doesn't have a whole lot going for it, and it's just like, it's kind of okay, there's a bunch of decent cards, but um, basically if I get one of those combos out early, I have a really high chance of winning, and if I don't, things don't always go super well. So that's an example of a combo deck and the way you might want to look at that. Next we're going to look at a race deck. So this one's going to be quicker because um, it's just 
there's not as much to, talk, to cover here. Uh, Kingsel, the Doctor of the Tower. It's Brobnar Sanctum and Shadows, also from Call of the Archons. And this is, of all the decks I've ever opened, this is the one that has the highest default gem, uh, Amber generation, um, especially with the double Virtuous Works. It's just, you just play it and gain three Amber. Imagine starting the game with two Virtuous Works in your hand, which I've had numerous times. You just first turn, play two of them, like if you're second player, that is. Play two of them, six Amber, check. You already have your opponent in check, potentially very first turn of the game. Just ridiculous. Um, a lot of the cards in this deck, like, this is one of those ones where I am mostly just following blinking lines, uh, first-hand probabilities thing, because you are just trying to race through your deck. There's so many cards that just give you amber just for playing them. There's other cards that help you steal amber and do all kinds of stuff. Some of the cards are reactive. You know, Heb the Huge um, for Brobnar. Six power comes into play, deal two damage to each other undamaged creature. Uh, that's really good for later on in the game. And there's also cards like Burn the Stockpile, which is great to have for later, and uh, Bait and Switch. So some of those, like if I start with a lot of those in my hand, even if I had four or five Brobnar cards, if I have Burn the Stockpile and Double Heave the Huge, then I am going to mulligan. Even if there's two more Brobnar cards, like if, if I have cards like that that aren't going to do much, that are going to be awesome later, then I will mulligan. But generally speaking, this is all about, you know, when you have a race deck or a, a one that gives you a lot of amber, you want to put the pressure on your opponent to keep putting them in check and force them to slow you down and try to keep up. Next, we're going to go over a, car, a deck that uh, I call this sort of just like a... A deck that revolves around a specific strategy or specific cards, and this one is Jonah, Vault Head of the Spiky Plateaus. So this one is actually from Mass Mutation, and there's one card in particular that kind of determines uh, most of my success or failure with this deck. Of the ones I'm going to cover in this example section, this is the one I've played the least, um, but there's one card I want to highlight, which is one of my favorite cards in the entire game, and it is the Archivist. So it's a rare for Logos, 3 power. If you archive the Archivist, archive it face up. I don't know of any cards that any other cards in the game that do this. While it's in your archives, instead of picking up all of your archives, you can choose to pick up any number of cards in your archives. So that's from any house. This is so, so, so powerful. I don't have a ton of other cards in this deck that allow you to archive cards, but Mobius Scroll lets you do it. And I have three of these um, Eclectic Inquiry. When you play it, uh, so it gives you an average for playing it. Play archive the top two cards of your deck. So basically, if I can get the archivist in my archives early, face up, the whole rest of the game, I have this choice of which cards I'm going to take out of my archive and when, and it gives me so much control over my deck, so much control over the game. I've only played with this deck maybe four or five times, but it has literally been, if I get the archivist archived early enough, um, relatively early, let's say before my opponent has forged their first or maybe even second key, I win every time. And if I don't, then I don't win because the deck on its own isn't maybe good enough otherwise. There's other cards like the Spirit's Way and Double Spirit's Way that like early game are not good. So, you know, I might want to mulligan if I get those, even if I do have um, the Archivist. And the Eclectic Inquiry works better. Like those are off the top of your deck. So you might not want, you know, the Archivist at the in your starting hand because then what are you going to do? Hold on to him. And because once he gets into play, you might not be able to archive him. Um, I mean, if you have one in your deck in a different way, but that's just another example. If I have multiple of these Eclectic Inquiry, I'm just going to try and keep those in my hand and play those right off the bat to hope that I'm going to archive the Archivist. And if not, then I'm going to have to wait till I get uh, Mobius Scroll into play and then do something tricky with that. So that's an example of one of those specific cards. And the final one I want to talk about real quick is a slower control deck or a deck that has anti-synergy. So this is the second deck I ever opened. It's called Nova Drab, the Braggart of Strategy. Um, three of my favorite houses, Dis, Logos, and Mars. There's only one Mars creature in this deck. The whole deck, I think, has 10 or 11 creatures only. Mars only has one. Uh, and there's the Mars cards, are a lot of them are pretty bad and are pretty useless, especially like early game or on their own. There's so many cards in this deck that are bad early game. This is such a reactive deck. But there's some good artifacts, especially in Dis. So this is a deck where, this was one of my worst decks too. Like when I first started off because of the amount of anti-synergy, like there's six or seven artifacts and I think there's two or three cards in this deck that just say destroy all artifacts. Like there's Strange Gizmo and there's EMP Blast for, for Mars. So even if I if I got those cards early and it's destroy all artifacts, they don't do anything because my opponent doesn't have artifacts in play. But even if I get my own artifacts out early, then those cards I don't want to play later because they might destroy my own artifacts. But the only way I've had a chance of winning is to get out stuff like I have two Dominator Baubles and a Lash of Broken Dreams. If I can get one or two Dominator Baubles out early, that is such a huge help because then when I go Logos, where I have six creatures, which is the house with most creatures um, by far, um, or when I get Logos creatures into play later, then when I go Dis again, like with this type of deck, I found that I'm successful when I go as Dis more, like 
most of my turns throughout the game have to be dis because I can still do stuff with my other Logos creatures on the board with Dominator Bobble and I can keep using Lash of Broken Dreams over and over to stall my opponent. I can get other discards like uh, Schuler that allow me to steal from them. Um, you know, Key Hammer will let me unforge their key and that kind of thing. There's only a few cards in this deck really that are good early that aren't artifacts like... Um, what is it, Mind Barb, uh, that you know, when your opponent discards a random card from their hand, Deep Probe for Mars can be good, but because a lot of the Mars stuff is reactive and involves having creatures in play and there's only one creature, it's just not very good. So um, in general, this is a deck that's really tough to play as, um, but and another one I want to highlight quickly is Gateway to Dis. I mentioned this previously, destroy each creature, gain three chains. I don't have a lot of like board wiping stuff in this in this deck, at least that's not at my disposal, at my, my choice. Like, Strange Gizmo just destroys each creature and artifact after a key is forged, but that's not always up to you. So if I get Gateway, Gateway to Dis in my opening hand, absolutely I'm going to mulligan. I don't even care how many discards I have. Um, I'm going to mulligan because, like, I need that Gateway to Dis later to wipe my opponent's board. Um, so there's just... these There are things that you really have to take into account. I mean, if I had Battle Fleet with Mars with a bunch of other cards, I would consider that because if I can churn through a whole bunch of Mars, then I clear and skew my deck in favor again of Mar or by Dis and Logos. But that's just some quick examples of some of the deck's uh, archetypes and how you might want to look at your mulligan strategy depending what you have and also depending the deck you're against. And this is one where I always feel like it's a mismatch, so I'm always super aggressive. I mulligan almost every time with this Nova Drab deck unless I'm really, really, really happy happy with my opening hand because I know that there's so many cards in this deck that are bad early so I have to be extra aggressive and hope for something really good. Now I just want to leave you with a couple of final thoughts and just some sort of like keys to success. Some of these are just going to be a recap of what I've gone over. Um, basically know your deck well. The better you know your deck, the cards in your deck, and the better you know your opponent's deck if you're not playing in a sealed deck tournament, uh, the more success you're going to have because the more information you're going to have to make that decision. So just consider as many factors as you possibly can. Again, consider is your deck fast or a slow deck? How does your opponent's deck match up against it? Have you had success? You know, are there specific cards that you know in your deck are like, if you get that early, it gives you a huge advantage or you have a card that's really good late game and you don't want to start with that in your hand always factor that in before you just consider the statistics of oh do I have four or five or six cards of this house and can I play through my deck faster right very very important um, I would just say in general when in doubt mulligan like if you're not sure just mulligan especially as first player because again as first player an, a big strong start is so so important um, I can't say enough just like when in doubt mulligan you will learn from your mistakes you'll see uh, over time if mulligan has worked or not worked depending on the deck you have um, and don't just apply the same strategy to all your decks like you have to reconsider what approach to your mulligan you know matters most and again go through those examples look at those decks I had feel free to leave some questions in the comments below uh, I will leave you with one final thing uh, on a somewhat unrelated topic there is a Michael Jordan quote that applies to this and I know it might sound ridiculous for me to bring this up but this is one of the most competitive people in the history of sports and competitive things in general I was a big basketball fan when I was younger a uh, big Michael Jordan fan and he had a quote that is I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career I've lost almost 300 games 26 times I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed I failed over and over again in my life and that is why I succeed and that is the perfect like encapsulation of my whole point about this is the a mulligan is really a skill it's something that you have to master to know when to get a, a sense for when it makes sense to mulligan or not you really have to do it a lot you have to play a lot of games the more you mulligan with a specific deck or you choose not to mulligan and be analytical be critical look at that decision try and remember off the bat take a mental note was that a good mulligan? Did you feel like you got a better hand? And if so, did you beat a deck that you feel like was better than yours? And was it because of the mulligan? Okay, now you know to keep that in mind next time you play. Or did you mulligan and you got rid of a good card and then you got a worse hand and you, you know, lost because of it and you feel like your start was kind of messed up? This is something you really have to practice. It's a skill you have to improve at. So again, the more you'd mulligan, the more you're going to get better at it. But that's the last thing I'm going to leave you with. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please let me know in the comments below whether you did or not. Um, I hope to do more Keyforge content in the future. I know the game is kind of in a bit of a, 
a hiatus right now, um, but it's still a game that I'm very passionate about. I love Keyforge, um, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Please consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't yet. Uh, if you have any questions or you want my opinion on decks in terms of mulligan strategy, um, I am I am quite busy. I have a, an eight and a half week old baby. I can't guarantee I'm going to look into your deck in full and give you like super detailed advice, but I absolutely will respond to every single comment left uh, within a day or two. So um, please let me know. I'm always open to feedback on this kind of stuff. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.